Well, good morning again, and uh, if you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open it again to the book of Exodus. We'll be in Exodus chapter 15 again this morning. Uh, we'll be in verses 11 through 21 as we finish out this song that we started last week. And so again, to just kind of catch you up, God's people, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people have been in captivity in Egypt for a few hundred years. God has now miraculously um, allowed them to leave through uh, many different plagues. Uh, God has brought upon the Egyptian people, Pharaoh, and the Egyptian people have now said that they can leave. They're no longer under slavery. He has miraculously parted the Red Sea and allowed them to walk through into their freedom and into the salvation that God has promised them. And on the other side of the Red Sea, their leader, Moses, stops and he uh, writes and this song and they sing this song together. This is uh, the first recorded song in the Bible, and uh, it is a song that, while is uh, the most ancient song that at least we know of in, in the history of God's people, um, it is a song that is just as relevant today as the day that it was penned. We, the songs that we sang this morning, every one of the songs that we sang this morning, had some element of this song in it this morning about the love of God, the, the salvation of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God. All of those things are in this as well. And so this, while it is ancient, it truly is, like the rest of the Word of God, timeless. It truly does still show us and teach us uh, two things, really. One, about who God is and what God has done. And also about how we should respond to who God is and what God has done. And so this week, uh, again, we're going to be in verses 11 through 21, the second half of this psalm. And we'll see uh, a few more things about who God is and why he is worthy to be worshipped and praised. And so follow with me, if you will. Uh, again, Exodus 15, beginning in verse 11. God's perfect and inspired word says this. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them, and your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia, and the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them, and all the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as, the, as still as a stone, till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with the chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the tim timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with the timbrels and with dances and Miriam answered them sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider has thrown into the sea and so again in this song and in this text uh, Moses is leading the people and then ultimately Miriam leads the rest of the people we'll talk about that later but all of the people are being led into this song of worship this song of praise and adoration to God he has as we talked last week has become their song he is the reason that they sing he is the object of their worship and in the, this text today, we again see many things that would cause us, as well as them, to want to and to have a need to worship God, to sing out in praise that He would become our song, that He would be the reason that we worship, and He would be the object of our worship. And the first thing is found in verses 11 through 13. He says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? 
who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. You stretch out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The first thing that Moses recognizes about God and sees probably more clearly than he's ever seen in his life after this has happened is the uniqueness of God. He says, who is like you? There is no one who is like you, right? And then he says that there's no one who can do the things that you have done, who stands in the power and the majesty. He, he calls out, his, he, he says that he is glorious in his holiness, that there are no other gods that are like him. Now, this is important, remember, in the context of this time and, and place of where they're living. Because if you remember back, however many months ago it was, that we began talking about the plagues that God sent on Egypt, every one of those plagues had some sort of way to show that our God, the true God, Jehovah, is more powerful and unique, separated than the false little g-gods of Egypt. And so they would have worshipped many things that in their mind would have overcome that which God has sent to them. And yet in every single plague, God shows that he is unique. God shows that he is the true God and their gods are actually false. The same, is, the same reality is today, that our God is the one true God, amen? That, that all other gods that anyone would worship are little g-gods, whether those are gods uh, that people call by name or whether those are gods that even people who would say they don't believe in a God have made their God, right? Who have trusted in, who have worshipped those things of the world. All of those are inferior compared to our God. He has defeated all of them. He has done more wonders. If you notice in verse 11, he says, fearful in praises, doing wonders. In other words, God outdid them. If you remember at the very beginning when Moses comes to the Egyptian people and he has the staff and he does these, what we would call, I guess in comparison to some of the big plagues that he did, kind of small miracles. Is that even a, can you call a miracle a small? I don't know. Anyway, the, these, these other little things, right, where, where the staff would change into something. And remember at the beginning, Pharaoh's magicians matched it, right? But then they couldn't. Then they were outclassed. Why? Because our God is the one true God. I want you to notice that he says that he is glorious in holiness. This is, it, we need to understand one thing. When we declare something to be holy, we are making an emphatic statement. Would you agree with that? If, if we say that we are unholy, we are emphatically saying that we are sinful, wretched people, right? But when we declare that God is holy, we are making an emphatic statement about who he is, that he is spotless, that he is perfect, that he is without blemish, that he is always right, that he is always true, that he, that he never makes a mistake, that he never has, that he never will. All of those things, he is absolutely holy in everything that he does. But somehow, Moses says that he needs to add to the emphaticness of being holy. He says that he is gloriously holy. That in his holiness, he is due the glory of people. That because he is holy, because the things that he has done are holy, he is due and honor uh, or, or should be given the glory from people. That we should worship him, that we should honor him because of who he is and because of what he has done. And so what we see when he calls him glorious, we see that one, he is, he, he is, glory, or he is holy, when he calls him holy, he is holy in and of himself. But that that holiness has now fleshed out, if you will, in the things that he has done. And because of that, he says that he should receive glory, that we should glorify him, that we should praise him. If you notice the other thing that he says, he says, fearful in praises, that he should be praised with a special reverence, that he should be worshipped with a special reverence, that we should come into his presence and, and engage in worship with a, with a fearfulness or a, a reverence within our hearts. I think sometimes, no, I'm not going to say I think. Sometimes in the church today, 
when we engage in worship through song, which, by the way, isn't the only kind of worship. But when we engage in worship through song in the church today, one of the things that we lack many times is a reverence in our worship. One of the things that, that lacks, especially in the church in the United States, and I guess probably in all of the world, is this idea of a reverence when we worship. That we remember that we are worshiping a glorious, holy God. That, that we, as R.C. Sproul likes to call us, the dirt people, get to talk to that God. Right? Just, just think about the other things in our lives that we would do reverently. Right? Think about the other people that we would talk to reverently. There are other people that because of their position or because of their status or just maybe because we have to. Right? Maybe it's your boss at work and maybe you don't particularly like the person, but... Because you need to keep that job, you speak to them reverently, right? And, and because the Bible says to honor those people who are uh, over us in those situations. But there are people in the world today that if you met them, right, you would say, oh, hello, sir. Nice to meet you, right? You, you wouldn't flippantly walk up and, and, you know, give them some knuckles or something. My, I don't know, my kids might. But, but right, they, we, we, would, we would look at them in a different way. But the reality is, is that those are just a bunch of dirt people, too. And not that you shouldn't be reverent and respectful full of people, but that our reverence and our respect should go up so high when we worship this gloriously holy God. But there should be, there should be a reverence within our heart because he is holy. In verses 12 and 13, Moses shows two ways in which God is holy and, and shows his holiness. First, he is holy in his judgment. In verse 12, he says, You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. He's mentioned this two or three times in this psalm that, that God, when he allowed, after he allowed the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea and the Egyptian army chased them over there, he let the waters come back down and they were consumed in that. In that, judging the sin of the Egyptians. Again, this is not some angry God who just desires killing or bloodthirsty God. This is a God who, because he is holy, judges those who would sin against him and his people, judges those who would, who would not turn, who would not relent, who would not repent. He, he judges those who will not humble themselves before him. These people were actively seeking the, the destroying of his people, and God, in his holiness, judges sin. And today, he is the same God. He, again, is not a God who desires judgment. He is not a God who is bloodthirsty. He is not a God who desires to, to judge people for eternity. But he is a God, because of his holiness, when people are against him, when people will not repent, when people will, will not humble themselves before them, he still is a God who is holy. And he still is a God who will judge. He is a holy judge. He has never one time given judgment upon someone who did not deserve it. Never once. Now, we can't say that, can we? I think I've told you this story before, but this is a story from my childhood of how me as the middle child was uh, grossly um, uh, abused as a child. <laughs> but there was a time, I remember this very clearly, there was a time that uh, my parents, we were living in, um, we were living in a, a small uh, modular home, and they had bought a larger modular home, and they were moving it in like next. So we were living here, and this one was going to be here, right? And they had dug the, the, the footings for it. And so we had these, this series of these holes in our yard, and then it rained, and it filled them up with water. And so my brothers and I, had, we had a bunch of G.I. Joes at the time. Remember the G.I. Joes? Some of you kids are like, what are you talking about? Anyway, they were cool, all right? So we had G.I. Joes, and we had boats and airplanes, and we were out there playing and floating our boats in these big holes uh, in, in the ground. And before we went outside, my mom said, do not get in that water. Do not come in this house wet, okay? So we've been playing, my brothers and I have been playing, and we're, we're actually kind of getting along. It's going fairly well, which was not normal for us. And I'm down, and my mom comes to the door, and she yells that supper is ready. 
And because that's what happened back in the day. You went outside until supper was ready. It's a crazy thing. Anyway, right? And so, so mom comes in and she, mom comes out. She says, says supper's ready. She goes back in. We go to pick up our stuff. There's one boat left in there. I reach over to get the one boat. My little brother goes like this. Boom. And I go head first all the way, all the way under into this footing. Climb out, covered in mud, just as filthy as you can possibly be. My brothers walk in like nothing ever happened. They're sitting eating. My mom meets me at the door, and she's hitting me before I even, like, she is just roundhousing me. And the whole time, I'm like, he kicked me in. He kicked me in. Finally, she stops, and I was like, my brother kicked me in. And she turned to him and said, why would you do that? <laughs> that was it. She was not holy in that moment. And I have not forgiven her for her unholy judgment. And maybe I should, but I've not yet done it, right? But God has never and will never and can never judge someone that does not deserve it. Because all of us deserve it. But here's the good news. He is not just holy in his judgment. He is holy in his mercy. Look what he says in verse 13. You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your inhabitation. Church today, we above all things worship God because of his mercy. God did not guide. We need to make sure. I know we've said this a couple times in this sermon series. But we need to make sure this is crystal clear. God did not save the Israelite people because they deserved it. He did not deliver them because they deserved it. He delivered them because he is a God that is full of grace and full of mercy. They were just as... As, as guilty to be under the Red Sea as every Egyptian that had ever walked. And yet in his mercy, he has saved them. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And he says in verse 13, In your mercy you have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. When he says that he has been redeemed, it says that they have been purchased. He says that in verse 16, whom you have purchased. In other words, there, have been, there has been a transfer of ownership. This could not be any more real in this context than what it is. When we talk about that, when we talk about us being redeemed and us being purchased, there's always this part of us, especially as like Americans and, and, and people who live kind of free. I don't know. We're, we're more free than a lot of people, Right. We always think about this, well, I don't know, was I really a slave to this? Was I really owned by this? These people were really owned. They were really someone's property, and God really redeemed them, and they are really now his. He has bought them out. He has redeemed them. There has been a, a change of ownership. Then he has led them and he has guided them. Don't you love that about the relationship that we get to have with God today? That he doesn't just buy us away and we're not just slaves, not, no longer slaves to sin. But now he leads and he guides and he directs and he, he walks with us daily with the Holy Spirit dwelling within the life of the believer. What a, what a great thing that he doesn't just buy us out and then, and then say, all right, figure it out. No. He leads us in that every day. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We have been redeemed through the blood. We have been forgiven of sins according to the riches of His grace. Again, we too are recipients of this redemption not because we deserved it. Not because God looked at us and said, oh, you are a little more special than this person. No. Because he is a God of grace. Because he is a God of mercy. And so we stand and we worship because he is a God who is holy. He is a holy judge and he is holy in his mercy. If it were not for the mercy of God, None of us would see God. 
But because of the mercy of God, we have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. So the first thing is that he is unique. The second thing is this. Look in verses 14 through 16. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. And the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as a stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord. Till the people pass over whom you have purchased. These people that he, are talking, he is talking about are the people that eventually will, or at this time, inhabit the land that God has promised them. And these are the people who God eventually will overcome so that the Israelites can inhabit the promised land. In fact, they're listed pretty much in order of how they will be defeated. And so what he is saying is that he is not just a God who is a God of deliverance today. He is a God of, who is a God of deliverance tomorrow. They will hear and they will fear. Do you remember when... Um, when the Israelites started, they send the spies into Jericho. We talked about this in our, uh, some of our upward devotions. And they send the spies in, into Jericho and they talk to Rahab. Do you remember Rahab says, everybody is scared to death of you. We have heard about your God. We have heard about what he has done to everyone else. And we are terrified. That is a paraphrase, by the way. But that is essentially what she said. We have heard about your God. He is to be feared. He is just as powerful in his judgment today as he is tomorrow as he was then. They will hear and they will fear his wrath. Here's the reality. Those who stand in opposition to God today should Fear him. When the boy, here we go. Get your emails ready. When the president of the United States celebrates the murder of unborn children in the, in the State of the Union address, and people stand and cheer, they should fear God. Because it's an abomination. And those who will reject him and those who will stand in his way, those who would defy him, those who would come against him and his people should fear God. Because he will overcome them. Look what it says in verse 15. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. They will melt away. In verse 16, they will be as a stone till your people pass over them. Because the inhabitant, the inhabitants of this land of God's people is an absolute guarantee. Now, some of these people, some of these lands were lands that they have to get through in order to get to the promised land. They could have just let them walk through. And had they let them walk through, God would not have destroyed them, would he? But because they stood into opposition to a holy God, they melted away. Here's what we need to understand about our God today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 13 says this, about a day that is yet to come. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in the holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming, coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
is a God who still today will judge those who stand in opposition to him. There will be no clapping on that day. There will be no celebration of sin on that day. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So how much more should we as a church in preparation for that day declare the gospel shout from the rooftops the goodness of God and the mercy of God and the opportunity for salvation and the free gift of grace that he offers knowing that that day will surely come so first because he is unique second is because he is to be feared by the nations third because the Lord reigns verses 17 through 19 you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with the chariots and his horsemen into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. The Lord reigns. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. I love in this text, that the way that it is written, that is a sentence all by itself. I don't know if that's the way it's printed in your Bible, but it's a sentence all by itself. And here's why I think that that is written that way. Because even this is one of those verses, and listen very carefully, I will almost never, ever, ever tell you to do this. But this is one of those verses that you can grab a hold of and you can pluck and you can put on your wall because every single day and every single place throughout all of the rest of eternity and all eternity before us, the Lord shall reign. He reigns. And he has proven to them that he reigns. Listen, if you would have went before the plagues, if you would have went to any Egyptian, to any person in Egypt, in fact, if you would have went probably to any Israelite, if you said, who reigns? They would have said, Pharaoh reigns. Pharaoh is in control of this place. Pharaoh says what happens. Pharaoh says this. Pharaoh, when he says we move, we, we move. When he says we work, when we work. When Pharaoh declares a law, it's the law. Pharaoh reigns. And God walks in and says, no, I reign. Pharaoh is nothing under my feet. Pharaoh has no power unless I give him power. And so he has already proved that Pharaoh does not reign. Some of them might have said, well, Pharaoh reigns on earth, but in the heavenlies, our gods reign. We, we trust in this God to reign over the water. And we trust in this God to reign over the animals. And we trust in this God to reign over, over our fruitfulness. And we trust in this God to reign over this. And all of those gods have been proven that they do not reign. That our God reigns. That the Lord reigns and he shall reign forever. He reigns over the false gods. He reigns over Egypt, Egypt and Pharaoh. And he reigns over Canaan, even though he has not come into that place yet. Do you notice the, the verses just before that? It says that they're going to melt. It says that they will be defeated. It, Moses believes that God reigns over the promised land, even though the promised land has not come into fruition for them yet. That is good news for you and I, because God reigns tomorrow. So some of us are at points in our lives where the next five years are transitional and pivotal. Because maybe some of you haven't thought about that yet. But we were talking just the other day, Jackie and I were talking uh, with someone. And uh, I don't know if it's actually going to happen, but at the last SBC convention, they voted to uh, make Hawaii a destination for an SBC convention. Yeah, I know. And we're going. <laughs> and I don't know who's paying for it and I don't care we're going right if that happens we're going but anyway we were talking about the fact that 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 they already have those conventions planned out for the next four years so it would be like five years from now we're like oh yeah five years from now and in that moment and I wasn't I literally, literally was not thinking about that in that moment Jackie says well uh, Solomon will be out of high school <laughs> Vincent will be like a senior Canaan will be in high school. We won't have Little League Baseball to deal with. We won't have this to deal with. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, there was just like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, 
let's go to Hawaii, right? <laughs> but uh, so there was these two kind of these two kind of moments, and, and sometimes in our lives when we think about, oh my goodness, in five years my kid is going to be here, or my grandkid's going to be here, or I'm going to be in this situation, or I'm gonna, or maybe I'm not going to be in this situation, or will I be able to live in my own home, or whatever it is. Here's what you need to know: our God shall reign in that day. He can't stop reigning. When we think about who's going to be the president of the United States, it doesn't matter. Our God shall reign. When we think about what we don't have, what we don't know what will happen in the Middle East, our God is reigning. When we don't know what will happen with Russia and Ukraine, our God is reigning. He shall reign. And he knows that they will reign over Canaan and over that land because that they will come into that land. But here is even the better news than that. God does not have just a general authority over all of the earth. He has a special authority, authority over all the earth. But he also has a special authority over a special people. Look at verse 17. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. God will reign over his people in his place because God brings them to that. Do you notice that he will plant them? These are a people who have never understood what it means to be planted, and certainly the people who finally get into the promised land after wandering their entire lives. The people who enter the promised land had wandered their entire lives because those who came out of Egypt all died before they went in. They will be planted for the first time. It is a mountain of his inheritance shared with them. It is not just a place to come to, but is the dwelling place of God that he is bringing them into. You notice that? In the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which you established, which your hands have established. This is the hope that God gives his people. That he doesn't just somehow own us. He doesn't have just some sort of overarching authority to us but that he brings us into the place of his dwelling. That he reigns in his sanctuary. And he calls you and I into that place. What, what an amazing hope that they have. Knowing that they will dwell in the presence of God. They're, they're already experiencing it in some point, in some aspect because of the pillar of cloud and fire. But in that moment, it won't be to follow. It will be to live in. <coughs> it will be to dwell in. It will be to sanctuary, to rest in. And today, he has a special, a special reign over his people. And he has called us in. That we get to experience today, but here, here's, here's the hope that we have. In this moment, for the Israelite people, they are traveling, are they not? They are, they are walking towards something that they have yet to fully see. They, it's a promise. They believe they will have it, but they have yet to fully grasp it. And we too, while we have been brought in to the presence of God, into fellowship with His Son, into communion with the Holy Spirit, as we have been brought into that relationship, we too, those who are believers, are still traveling to something that we will be planted to. And Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way, you know. What a hope that we have. That this, this is, this is the worst Will ever experience 
This life, this world, is the worst we'll ever have to live through if we're a believer in Jesus Christ. But friend, this morning, if you are not, it's the best you'll ever have. The last thing is this. Look at verse 20 and 21. Then Miriam, the prophetess, sister of Aaron, took the, the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and, the ride, and its rider has thrown into the sea. The last thing is that in this moment, everyone worships. It was a common practice, most scholars believe, in that day, and even today in Jewish culture in some, in some forms, that men and women would have worshipped independently of one another. And so it's believed that maybe when Moses is singing, it's primarily the men who are singing, which would be a novel idea in the church today that men would actually sing. It's okay if you do, by the way. Um, just sit in the front and then nobody has to hear you. That's what I do. Only these people up here have to deal with my voice, right? But here we see, and here's, here's what I hope happens here. Here we see Miriam answering the call to worship. That's what we do every Sunday here. We come here and we invite you to worship the God who is the God who redeems, who is the God who is holy, who is the God who is glorious, who is the God to be reverenced, who is the God who saves and gives mercy and grace. And as Moses proclaims these things, Miriam and the women answer with the same thing. Do you notice in verse 21 it says that Miriam answered them? They answered the call. Most scholars believe that they didn't just sing this part of the song, but that they sang the whole song. And all of them together worshipped, men and women, no longer separate, but together worshipped. Miriam, it's believed that Miriam was probably the sister of Moses that went to the Nile River and let him go down. We haven't heard from her since, and we don't hear from her a whole bunch after but we do know that she had a significant role in leading the people to worship in this moment and uniting the worship in this. In fact, in Micah chapter 6, verse 4, it says, For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So she had a significant role in leading those people, specifically the women, but the people, into worship together. It's interesting that it's the women who get the timbrels out, the tambourines out, and dance. I don't know, maybe that's still today. That probably is. But there was an enthusiasm. There was a joy. There was, there was the use of a talent with instrumentation in their worship. And we too today, I hope that our answer to the call to worship God is not, well, I guess if I have to. I hope it's not, well, if it's just the way I like it. I hope it's not, well, how many more songs do we have to do? I hope it's my God is my Redeemer. And my God is gloriously holy. And my God is to be, fe to be feared among the nations. And my God has brought me into his presence. He has purchased me with his blood. And because he has done these things and because of who he is, I will emphatically worship that God. Last thing this morning, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have yet to repent of your sin and turn to Christ, he is calling you to be a worshiper of him today. He is calling you into his presence. He is calling you out of his judgment and into his mercy today. Saying, come dwell with me. I'll build a place for you for all of eternity. Let's pray as the worship team comes. 
Heavenly Father, this morning we are a people who are humbled by your goodness, humbled by your holiness and by your mercy. God, we are a people who recognize that we, like the Israelites, only come into your presence because you have brought us in by your grace. Father, we pray this morning for anyone who may be outside of that today, that today would be the day that you would call them into it. You would call them into a relationship with you, a forgiveness of sins. Father, we pray that today would be a day that we would engage joyfully in worship. That we would be people who recognize who you are and what you've done. God, because of that, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we do proclaim you to be all of the things that Moses proclaimed you to be. And God, we thank you that we can see them even more clearly because we have have known Jesus through your word. So Father, we glorify you this morning. Above all things, above all people, we glorify you this morning. We reverence you this morning above all things. Father, we love you today. We thank you that you love us. We ask this in Jesus' name.